right, good morning, New Spring Church. We're so glad that you're here right now. I want to invite you to go ahead and stand to your feet. We're starting this morning off by declaring war on Satan. If you didn't already know, we're in a battle, but we have nothing to fear because God is for us, and that means that nothing can stand against us. So we got a song to sing. We're going to clap our hands. I got joy in my soul because God is in control. I got Satan on my trail. while I pray. No matter the attack, I won't turn back now. This means war, yeah. Say it a little bit louder now, come on. See, this means war. All right, I know it's early, but you guys gonna help us out. This means war, hey, hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. This means war. Come on, go ahead. Hey. Say, I feel I feel stays the same whatever's going wrong my war clothes are on i might be in a daze but you can't have my praise no matter the attack i won't turn that down this means war oh, yeah yes, this means war Glad to be at New Spring today. I know it's cold and and freezing drizzle outside, but I'm so glad you guys are here. We're starting a brand new series today called Wars of Worlds of Warfare 2 Behind Enemy Lines. Today I'm going to be bringing you a talk called PSYOP. But I gotta tell you, you're in for a very, very special worship service if you haven't already figured that out today. I went home after the four o'clock service and watched it over and over and over again. So I, it's just great to worship God and to be here. By the way, I'd like for you to meet a friend of mine. I'm here with Kiki Torres. Kiki pastors a mega church, and <laughs> I can't say it right, Canadá, Mexico, and they are just, it's just an enormous church, very much like New Spring Church. And he and I have been buddies for a good while. Kiki is hanging with me. He's in between conferences. He was at, in Kansas City. He's headed for Atlanta. So would you say hello to my good friend, Kiki Torres. I just noticed there's a lot of red in the room. 
You guys doing anything this evening? <laughs> it's just so good to see you today. We're going to worship God and lift him up in praise, but for right now, we're going to receive an offering, and during COVID, we're not passing the buckets. They're out at the back. If you'd like to drop something in the bucket, I know that most of us give electronically these days, but I just want to tell you, we're talking about spiritual warfare in this series, Worlds of Warfare 2, and you know, you guys are really putting a big gash in the devil and his armies with how you give and make a difference in this world, and so thank you for your faithfulness in that area. I'm going to ask you just to have a seat for a moment, and then um, I'm going to show you some things going on here at New Spring Church. And then Austin and the band is going to be back today. We're going to have a wonderful time worshiping our Lord. And by the way, never forget this. When you worship God, you're giving God the breath back to him that he gave to you. And uh, so we've already gotten off to a great start. I, I love that. I'm going to miss that song. One of the great things about being lead pastor at New Spring is I get to go to all the services. So I'm going to miss that. By the way, did you guys know Carla Lawless could sing like that? Whoa. <laughs> We're just so glad you're here at New Spring. God bless. And I'll be back in just a few moments with the message. You can contribute to life change by giving to New Spring. And you don't have to be on campus to do so. The best and easiest way to give is online, which you can do on any device with internet access. Just visit newspring.org slash give or press give in the New Spring Kansas app and follow the on-screen instructions. You can choose to give a one-time gift or set up an automatic recurring donation. And after you've given once, it'll only take you about 10 seconds if you'd like to give again in the future. Learn more about giving to New Spring at newspring.org slash giving. Thanks for joining us today. We hope you'll consider joining us for these upcoming events. If you'd like to learn how to get a handle on your personal finances, consider taking Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University course. Sign up online for this nine-week class that begins at New Spring this Thursday, February 11th. Would you like to help us with our Easter TV broadcast? We'll be holding our March 1st Wednesday service one week earlier than usual on Wednesday, February 24th, so we can film the broadcast music in front of a live audience and we'd love for you to be a part. All you need to do is show up and sing along with us. Do you have a blended family? Join us March 12th and 13th for Blended, a two-day event for step parents, extended family members, and family educators with speaker and author Ron Deal. Register online to attend. Couples, take a weekend away to invest in your marriage at our 2021 Kansas City Marriage Retreat, June 11th through 13th. Sign up today to get the super early bird price. Thanks again for being here today. Remember, you can learn more about everything you just heard at newspring.org. Well, again, we're just so glad that you guys are here. I want to invite you to stand to your feet with me now as we enter into a time of corporate worship. And what that means is that we're going to elevate Jesus' worth in this place. To live a lifestyle of worship is to lift him up in our lives each and every day. But together, right now, we're going to lift him up in this place and declare and own for our lives to know and believe that he is the way maker. Will you sing this with us this morning? Because you are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. Because you are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you, yes, you are here, moving in our midst, and I worship you, I worship you, you are here, working in this place, and I worship you, I worship you. Because of who he is, we sing together now. Way make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. Sing that again. Say, Way make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. You.
darkness you sing, my God. That is who you are. Lift up your praises to him this morning and sing. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. Even when we can't see it. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working, no. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working, no. You never stop, oh, you never stop working, no. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. No, you never stop, you never stop working, Lord. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. No, you never stop. say thank you for who you are this morning, reminding us as your children that you love us, that you won't leave us or forsake us. And we know one day you will return, and that's why we can sing this next song with confidence. Help our spirits to be encouraged this morning, to run the race with endurance. Will you sing this with us? That you came, you're coming again. This time I
say thank you. We know that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And right now, we want to continue to give you the praise that we have inside of us, Father. We don't want to wait till it's commanded. We want to do it when we get to give it to you, Father. And we're choosing to do that with our lives. We're so thankful for who you are, that you are the way maker, and that you love us and you have prepared us for this season of life that we are in, even if we don't feel like we are. Because you are with us. We pray for Marcus. He's about to bring the message and Mitch, she's going to bless us one more time with a song, Father, but help us to receive what you would have for us to receive today in this place. And we're going to continue to give you the praise and the glory through it all. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you guys so much for worshiping with us today. You can have a seat. Many of you have written me and told me how you enjoy me bringing history into my sermons. Well, it's no secret. I am a history buff. But as a Christ follower and a church leader, I enjoy some history that our world never thought was all that important. I guess we could call it forgotten history with forgotten heroes. And I love to share these things with people who've never heard these stories. One of my favorite parts of American history has to do with music, gospel music, the music that influenced and shaped the music that we sing every week here at New Spring, even the new songs. About 100 years ago, there were a special group of hymn composers who wrote some music. You may well have never heard their names, but there's a good chance if you grew up in church, you know some of their music. History didn't make much of them, which is why you may never have heard of them. And I fear that's the case because they were African American. So through the month of February, each week, we're going to feature one of the songs. By the way, they all go with the sermon series. And with the song, I'm gonna tell you a little bit of the backstory. Today, I wanna to tell you about one of my favorites. His name is Thomas Dorsey. We call him the father of gospel music. He started out doing blues and some of his music was pretty sinful. But after he accepted the Lord, he felt the tug on his heart to devote his talents only to glorify God. And he responded writing over 400 gospel songs, many of which are among my favorites. The Lord will make a way somehow. It's a highway to heaven. Peace in the valley. Search me, Lord, old ship of Zion. And the song we need this year, it, it's called, If We Ever Needed the Lord, We Sure Do Need Him Now. But there's one song that was bigger than all the rest. For years, just about every famous artist covered it, and it was Dr. Martin Luther King's favorite song. Mahalia Jackson sang it at his funeral. And here's the story. Thomas Dorsey, while wrestling with the call of God on his life, had gone to sing for a revival. At the end of the service, someone told him, you need to go home right now. Your wife, she was about to give birth, is having problems. But when he arrived home, he was greeted with the news that she had died. A few days later, his newborn son died as well. I've seen the photograph of both his wife and his baby in the casket. In his loss, he got angry at God and decided he couldn't pray anymore and that he might just give up on God. But a friend said to him, you need to pray. And so he tried to begin a prayer, Lord, but that didn't say what he wanted to say. So he began again, precious Lord. And Dorsey said, the rest of the song spilled out of him immediately. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, help me stand. Today in 2021, we need this song, maybe more than ever before. So would you join me in this awesome song?
precious blood lead, lead me home. Wasn't that great? I, I just, <laughs> I went home and watched Mitch sing that song five times last night. And it, I told her a moment ago, I said, Professor Dorsey would be so proud. That was awesome, awesome. Well, we are at war. And if you follow Jesus, you feel that. But our war is not like other wars. And it's critical that we remember that. In fact, what I see happening with a lot of Christians is I see Christians who are doing warfare the way the world does warfare. So what I want to do is I want to take you back to Worlds of Warfare 1 that I preached last year, and I want to share with you the two most important aspects of spiritual warfare. No matter what we can learn about spiritual warfare, these two things are the foundations of it. So here is the first one from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. The Bible said, we are not fighting against people. Could I take a deep breath? And could we say that again? We do not fight against people. One of the things that we're watching go wrong in American Christianity today is there's this culture war between people. Now, I mean, here's the thing. There are things that are wrong and there are things that are right. And standing for the right thing is so important. But we, the word of God says we are not fighting against people. But we are fighting. So in other words, someone could say, well, if I'm in spiritual warfare and I don't fight against people, where am I? What am I fighting against? Well, fortunately for us, the Word of God is about to give us four designations. All four of these designations are for demons. I'm not, I mean, I think I have a, a, a basic understanding of the distinction between these terms, but at the end of the day, I'm not completely sure. I just know that every one of these terms refers to the army of demons that we're up against. And just in case the word demon freaks you out, I just need to let you know that when God created the world, he created angels. There was a revolution in heaven. Satan and a third of the angels sided against God. God kicked them out. And we know those rogue angels as demons. So the Bible tells us we're not fighting against people, but we are fighting against persons without bodies. So if you're fighting with anybody who has a body today, you're in the wrong war. We're fighting against persons without bodies, the evil rulers of the unseen world, those mighty satanic beings and great evil princes of darkness who rule this world and against huge numbers of wicked spirits in the spirit world. Now, huge numbers is right. If you were with me uh, last year in, in Worlds of Warfare 1, we said that Revelation chapter 5, verse 11 indicates there's a minimum of 33 million demons. And so that's what we're up against. I mean, we're, we're seriously up against a war of great force, and we feel it. By the way, it's intensifying. And we should not be surprised that it's intensifying because the Bible tells us about Satan in the last days in Revelation chapter 12, verse 12. The devil has gone down to you. He is filled with anger. He knows he doesn't have much time. So if you feel Satan and his angels fighting against you with intensity, that is the reason. He's, out, he's running out of time. And the one thing about Satan is Satan knows God keeps his word. He has no delusions of winning. Any, any delusions he had of winning, he lost in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus prayed, not my will, but your will be done. It was game, set, match right there. The war was over, and we're just waiting for the final chapter. But Satan is intensifying his attack against us and against God's people. And by the way, we'll talk about this maybe next week, but there is a growing persecution against Christians around the world. A lot of Christians are dying for their faith. I mean, we're sort of cocooned here in the United States but, I mean, when you look at what believers are going through in Africa and India and China and other parts of the world right now, there is an intensification of Satan's attack against Christ followers. Now, the first thing that we need to know about spiritual warfare, we just learned. We never fight against people. Second important thing that we need to know from 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, the Bible says, the weapons of our warfare are not human weapons. Now, when we look at that at first blush, we could have the idea that the Bible's talking about like military weapons, like Jane's, military, Jane's catalog of military hardware. 
That's not what the Bible's talking about. The Bible's talking about the stuff that humans use to fight and get the best of other humans. And on that list, you could put manipulation and uh, abuse and sarcasm and hostility and anger and racism. So, I mean, those are the weapons that humans use to fight humans. But if you're a, if you're a, if you're a princess warrior of the king, if you're a son of God, if you're, if, if you're a warrior for the king, you don't use those weapons. You don't use sarcasm. You don't use hate. You don't use anger. You don't use race and class warfare because we just don't use the weapons that the world uses. Now, someone could say, well, Mark, if I can't use the stuff that the world uses, how am I going to have any impact? Glad you asked. The Bible says the weapons of our warfare are not human weapons, but they are mighty through God, made powerful by God for the tearing down of strongholds. What are the weapons that we have? Prayer, confidence in the word of God, faith, worship, which you were doing just a few moments ago. Austin told us the truth when he said that Jesus comes in our worship through the person of his Holy Spirit and he's present with us. There is power in our worship. In what you just did, there is strength. And we all feel that when we walk out of this place because for a few moments we've been recharged I mean, these are the weapons that we fight with. And notice that the Bible says God makes them powerful. They're powerful to the point of pulling down strongholds. In Worlds of Warfare 1, I define strongholds for you. A stronghold is a lie that becomes commonly believed so much so that people regard it as the truth. How about that for 2021? You see those strongholds? But hey, you're not going to pull them down by writing hateful messages on social media. You're not going to pull those strongholds down by saying, oh, it's us against them. You're going to pull those strongholds down as a princess warrior of God on your knees in prayer. You're going to pull those strongholds down by trusting God and taking God at his word and by acting on the word of God. That's how we're going to bring the strongholds down. We're not helpless in these last days. We have been given mighty weapons that are made powerful for God, and they have the ability to pull down Satan's strongholds. If you're in Jesus' army, you don't fight like other people do. People fight with human weapons, and they hurt each other. They hurt each other mentally. They hurt each other emotionally and, and even physically. I mean, one of the things that really troubles me, and we actually have a series coming up on this after Easter, but I'm just watching the rage out there in our culture today. Anybody read a comment thread on social media lately? And one of the things that troubles me is people who claim to be Christians. I mean, I hear Christians who, you know, claim to be riding for God using profanity. Where did we learn those words? You know, and, and, and the thing of it is, are they right in their position? Maybe so, but they're very wrong in their disposition. And they're doing great harm. They're pushing away the very people that we need to reach. So here's the thing. If, if you're a princess warrior, if you're a prince warrior of God, never get caught up in the stuff that the world uses to get the advantage over other people. If you're part of Jesus' army, never forget you're part of the strangest army in history. Yes, we're behind enemy lines, but we're not here to hurt the people on the other side. We're here by the grace of God to offer rescue to the soldiers on the other side. You say, but Mark, I feel hate coming from them. Yes, but never forget that the very people that you feel hate coming from are victims of the enemy. You say, Mark, they don't feel like victims. Well, here's the thing. We're not here to hear my word. We're here to hear the word of God today. And so for all of us postmodern American Christians, we need to hear the word of God. And here's the thing that I'm going to throw at you and it's going to freak some of you out. We have to learn to be sympathetic with the people who hate us. Even though their positions are wrong, we need to feel for them. And here's why. The book of Ephesians gets it very clear. Because every once in a while, I talk to Christians who have an us versus them mentality. It's like, hey, I'm superior because I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. But we should never forget that we weren't always followers of Jesus Christ. Once we were outside the family of God. Read this with me. In Ephesians chapter 2, the Bible says, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts, read that, minds, of those who refuse to obey God. Notice it doesn't say that they necessarily choose to obey Satan. It's just the default position. Now, verse 3, all of us, 
By the way, do you know what the word all there means in Greek? It means all. It means 100% of us. All of us used to live that way. Following the passionate, this is an interesting couple of nouns here. Following the passionate desires, that means we used to follow our cravings. In other words, our cravings told us what to do. And then the second word here is inclinations, which means choices. In other words, that's what it means not to be part of the family of God. You are a slave to your inclinations and you're a slave to your choices. Because without the power of God, you can't stop making those choices. And the Bible says all of us used to be that way. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger just like everyone else. Why are we no longer there? Is it because we just started, we just said, okay, I'm going to change my life. And we got so good that God said, okay, you're, you're on the right side now. No. Verse 4, but God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. Amen. So... So yeah, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you can feel hate and persecution coming from those who don't know Jesus. But always remember, we're not fighting against people and we're not using human weapons. Those people are being victimized by Satan and we used to be over there where they are. And our job is to be behind enemy lines, not to harm anybody, but to offer rescue to those who don't know they even need rescue yet. We are behind enemy lines and we will be until we get to heaven. Now, I don't know a whole lot about being behind enemy lines, but I've studied enough military history to know that when you have, especially, let's just say, American soldiers behind enemy lines, there are two temptations, and you're going to face those temptations. The first temptation is to go AWOL, absent without leave, and the second temptation is to go rogue and start making up the rules for ourselves. Now, a lot of us in these days are going AWOL. And what happens when a, a princess warrior or a prince warrior of God goes AWOL, they're in this culture, they're behind enemy lines, and after a while they say, you know what, it would be easier for me to get rid of my uniform and just join the other side or at least fit in with the other side, and we go AWOL. The other thing is to get angry at the people on the other side and go rogue and start doing what we talked about earlier, which is fighting against people and using human weapons like a lot of Christians are doing today. We, I want to repeat, are part of the strangest army in history. We are behind enemy lines, but we're not behind enemy lines to hurt any human being. We're here to help rescue those people and to put a serious dent into Satan and his demonic army in these last days. One more time, I just want to get this across to us because I'm watching how Christians today are on social media and they're speaking with such hostility against the very people that we're trying to reach. The Word of God says, can I say that one more time? The Word of God says, gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Perhaps God will change those people's hearts and they will learn the truth. Here's the thing. God is not going to change anybody's heart if we are hostile. The word of God says, then they will come to their senses and escape the trap or escape the devil's trap. For they've been held captive by him to do whatever he wants. I love what 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 12 says. The Bible says, live an exemplary life among the natives so that your actions, heads up New Spring, will refute their prejudices. Hey, what I'm watching Christians do and say is confirming a lot of the prejudices that those people have. The Bible says live such a Jesus life. Live a life like Jesus so that your actions will cause even the people who hate you because you follow Jesus to scratch their head and say, well, that's not what I thought religious people did and said. Let me read it one more time. Live an exemplary life among the natives so that your actions will refute their prejudices. Then they'll be won over to God's side, and I love this, and be there to join the celebration when he arrives. Okay? That's just the introduction. That has nothing to do with today's sermon. <laughs> just wanted to introduce the series. Now let me bring you today's message. Let me tell you where Worlds of Warfare 2 Behind Enemy Lines started. Mary Alice and I read the Bible every morning. I don't mean the whole Bible. We just read a piece of it every morning. And, 
you know, we're just the perfect couple because, uh, I don't mean we're perfect. I mean, it's the Lord has put us together perfectly. That's what I meant by that. And Mary Ellen, she, she learns best when she reads out loud. And I like to be read to. Just works out great. I mean, you know, every morning, like around 5, 5.30, we're, we're, we're going through the Bible. And so last, I think it was September or so, we were going through the book of Isaiah. And I'm paying really close attention because Isaiah's times are a whole lot like my times and your times. In, in Isaiah, you could see the storm clouds on the horizon. God's people were doing some really bad stuff and judgment was on the way. But there was still a little sense of normalcy. It's that juxtaposition. And that's where we are here in America right now. We're in a lot of trouble. We see the storm clouds. We see them on the horizon. But at the same time, most of us are going to go home today, have lunch, and go watch the Super Bowl this afternoon. And it was into that sort of mix that God is speaking to Isaiah. Mary Ellis was reading through Isaiah chapter 8, and when she read one line, the Holy Spirit spoke to me as loudly as he ever has. I don't mean out loud audibly, but I mean just in my heart. And when I heard that line, Worlds of Warfare 2, Behind Enemy Lines, was born. And so today, I want to start the series where the series started in my heart with this one line from Isaiah chapter 8 and the 11th verse. In fact, I'm going to be in Isaiah 8 a lot today if you want to get located there, either electronically or old school. Here we go. Here's the line that gave birth to our series. The Lord has given me a strong warning. Not to think like everyone else does. Oh, could I say that one more time? The Lord has given me a strong warning to th not to think like everyone else does. Now, our series is about warfare, but today we're just going to be talking about our thinking. Because here's the thing. You show me a Christian who loses a battle with the devil, and the Christian loses the battle between his or her ears. And so today we're, we're doing a talk called PSYOP. I don't know anything about PSYOP. I mentioned that I was going to call that sermon PSYOP last week, and, and, a, and a wonderful New Springer reached. And one thing I love about New Spring, you know, every, sooner or later, everybody here has done just about every job that can be done. And a wonderful New Springer texted me and, and said that he had been in PSYOP for five years. I mean, years ago. He's, he's in private career world now, but he asked, he said, would you just like, and I said, absolutely, thank you. And, and so I, I called him a couple days ago and, and asked him if he would just give me PSYOP for dummies. Now, by the way, PSYOP means psychological operations. And he, and he just gave me so much wonderful information. And here's the thing, PSYOP for the U.S. is pretty different from PSYOP from the other powers, the hostile powers of our world. Because when the United States goes into into a foreign situation and use the PSYOP, what we're trying to do is not fight. We're trying not to have a war. We're trying to give out a message that says we're here to help, not hurt. And of course, PSYOP from a lot of ugly nations has to do with we're here to help, but they're really there to hurt. But we're not in that, we're in that first realm. And, and, and he gave me the motto for PSYOP, which I love so much and I won't ever forget this. He said, the motto of PSYOP is win the mind, win the day. And that I think is what the Holy Spirit is calling you and me to do as princess warriors and prince warriors of the king. It's important for us to understand that we are in the world behind enemy lines to give a message that we're here to help and not hurt. Okay, the word of God says... We're not to think like everyone else. This is where the battle is. Because you and I live in an age of groupthink. We're even watching the attempt of the powers that are to manage what we think. Now, I grew up in a very different era. In fact, when I grew up, the left was very, it was almost the opposite of where the left is today in the United States because when, when I grew up, that was the idea of the left that we should think critically and that we should think independently. And, and I'm not here representing the left or the right. I'm here representing Jesus Christ. I can just tell you here today, if you and I are going to make it in these days, we are going to have to have the ability to think critically and not have to get on our iPhones or, or any other electronic device to see what the comments are so that we will know how to think. We live in an age where people, it's like whatever the mob thinks is what I think. Whether the mob is on one side of the political spectrum or the other side. God help us to think critic 
to think independently and critically, line our thinking up with the word of God. It's a mistake to copy what other people think. This is a silly story. I said a few moments ago in the video that I love history, and I do love history. I love the story of a president who was president a few terms ago who loved to invite common people to the White House, especially if those common people had done something to distinguish themselves. And very quietly and privately, he would invite people to have dinner with him. And there were some common folk who went to have dinner with the president at the White House, but they were nervous that they were going to do the wrong thing. And so before they went into dinner, they agreed that they were just going to do whatever the president did. (laughs) They were going to watch him, what he did, they would do. So he picked up a particular fork. They picked up that fork. You know, he ate a particular part of his meal, and they would eat it, and they would eat in sequence. Everything was going great until the coffee came. And then it kind of went south. They brought out the coffee, and they watched the president, and he took his cup, and he poured some coffee in his saucer. And they thought, well, some people drink coffee out of a saucer, so they poured coffee into their saucers. Right after that, he took a spoon, dipped it in the sugar, got a spoonful of sugar, and stirred it in his plate, stirred the sugar into the coffee in his plate. And they thought, we've never seen that before, but maybe this is how they drink coffee at the White House. <laughs> and then the president put that saucer of coffee on the floor for his cat. <laughs> now, the reason I think about that story is a whole lot of Americans are pouring coffee for a cat they don't have. Because we're doing what we see other people do. And we're thinking, I have to check my thinking out to see if the group thinks that. Now, here's the thing. The Spirit of God comes to us today in Worlds of Warfare 2 with this opening line that we're not to think like everyone else. Now, fortunately for us, in the book of Isaiah chapter 8, God gives us two ways that we are to think. And I want to give those to you as we get to the end of our message. Here's the first one. We need to choose to focus not on the crazy stuff around us, but on God and what he's doing. And and that's the thing. It's just like Peter trying to walk on the water. We can either focus on Jesus or we can focus on the wind and the waves. Are the wind and the waves there? Sure. Are bad things happening in our world? Yes. Satan, as we saw, is angry. He realizes his time is short. Bad people are doing bad stuff. Mark has a choice. If I want to keep my sanity, I can't think like everybody else. I, I'm not in denial. I recognize bad things are happening. Bad people are doing bad stuff. But I know that our God is busy in this world, and our God is doing great things. I can't focus on both things at the same time. God said, Mark, I don't want you to think like everybody else. I want you to focus on me and focus on what I'm doing in the Now I'm about to tread on sensitive ground. But that's never stopped me before. My job is to give you the word of God. But I know before I go here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cause a few people to be unhappy. And, and the worst part about it is not that you'll be unhappy with me. The worst part is that you won't think this through and see what the Holy Spirit's trying to say. So even if I upset you with this, would you at least just back up a little bit and give the Holy Spirit some room to instruct your heart? Let me read the verse. Isaiah 8, verse 11. The Lord has given me a strong warning not to think like everyone else. He said, don't call everything a conspiracy like they do. And don't live in dread of what frightens them. Now, I know this was written for around 2700 B.C., but I feel like it was written for February of 2021. God said, I don't want you to think like everybody else. Stop calling everything a conspiracy. I have never seen a time in my life where Christian people have been more distracted by conspiracies than they are today. I mean, like I look on social media and people see a conspiracy here and conspiracy there and there's a coronavirus. Oh, no, it's all a conspiracy. I promise you, no human beings are smart enough to pull off the devastation of the coronavirus. Satan and his demons did it. And they look at this. Oh, this is a conspiracy and that's a conspiracy. Ladies and gentlemen, the battle is between God and Satan. It's not nation versus nation and snowflakes versus thinkers and left versus right. It is God versus Satan. The problem with conspiracy thinking is it's often trying to figure out how man can pull off what Satan and his demons are doing. And the problem is we start guessing that we know what humans are trying to do and we give Satan and his demons a pass. 
You know, I've got friends, I mean, dear friends that I love very much. And I'm like, they're, they're telling me, oh, there's this conspiracy and that conspiracy. Do you know what the problem with conspiracy thinking is? And some of you are saying, well, Mark, there actually are conspiracies. I know that. Bad people do bad stuff. But do you know what the problem with conspiratorial thinking is? There's several problems. Number one, let's be honest, it's guesswork. I mean, if it was fact, you would know it was fact. And I mean real fact. It's guesswork. The conclusions are not provable. And so here's the thing. If we start living in a world of guesswork, the people who are supposed to build their lives around truth are no longer building their lives on fact and truth anymore. We're building our lives on guesswork. That's the first problem. Number two, it can invite and stoke paranoia. And Lord knows the minds of Americans are are unhealthy enough already. But one of the things I've noticed is that people that are a little bit prone to paranoia, the conspiracy thinking like pushes them over the edge. By the way, do you know what the word paranoia means? It's from two Greek words that are jammed together. Para means beside, and noia is the Greek word for thinking, beside thinking. So, I mean, here's here's what it means. (laughs) I mean, like, like, when you leave the campus here today and you get on the exit, the access road for K96, and you look over there in the grass about 30, 40 yards away, and somebody's got a car and they're running alongside you, that is paranoia. They are off the road. They're off, they're they're no longer on the road anymore. And that's what paranoia is. It means you're off the road of rational thinking. And one of the things that troubles me about conspiracy thinking is it stokes paranoia. And then thirdly, it can create a silly kind of arrogance. Have you ever been around somebody that knows all the conspiracies and you're like, well, you have reasonable questions to ask about how that could be the case and they sort of look at you like, you know, you poor thing, you just don't know what I know. <laughs> I've got friends who, who, who I mean, they'll, 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 you know, I can tell. It's like, you just can't see what I can see. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. You know, because they sort of have that, I can see what you can't see. And I'm like, yeah, it's probably true. <laughs> And then fourthly, it often leads to going rogue. I just find this immensely significant that God said to Isaiah, I don't want you to think like everybody else. I mean, the people around you are seeing a conspiracy over here and a conspiracy over here. God's like, just focusing on what Satan is doing and his demons will keep you busy enough without trying to guess what other human beings are doing to do what only Satan can do. Let me read it one more time. The Lord has given me a strong warning not to think like everyone else does. He said, don't call everything a conspiracy like they do, and don't live in dread of what frightens them. This is, see, here's the thing. I I don't tend toward conspiracy thinking. I'm a grown-up, and and I I don't, I tend to ask hard questions. But here, I can get caught up in the second one of living in dread because I see the horrible things that are happening. But don't you find it beautiful that the God who knows that bad things are happening is saying, don't live in dread. Don't live in the dread that other people live in. You're a daughter of God. You're a princess warrior. You have been called to do great battle for the king. You're a son of God, and God is doing great things in the world. Why should you walk around living in dread when you follow the king who's already won this battle? I mean, here's a great verse, and I'm trying to absorb it in my heart. Don't live in dread of what frightens them. Make the Lord of heaven's armies holy in your life. Now, the word holy can creep some of us out because when we hear the word holy, we think of stained glass and pipe organ music. But that's not what holy means. Holy means separate. Let me explain what that means. When the Bible says keep, make the Lord holy in your life, one of the problems that I have with a lot of American Christians is they, they claim that Jesus is their Lord, but he's only one voice at the table. They've got their friends, they've got entertainment, they've got their politics. And like Jesus, if you'd like to weigh in on this, just what would you like to say? But he's only a voice among voices. Making the Lord holy in your life is saying, Jesus, you are Lord. Your voice is the important one here. Forget about my politics. Forget about the junk that's going on. Forget about what my friends say. Jesus, you are Lord. I want to hear what you've got to say. And so you understand God is saying, don't live in dread like everybody else does. Make the Lord holy in your life. The Bible says he's the one you should fear. He's the one who should make you tremble. And then look at this great line. He will make you safe. He will make you safe. So, 
if I focus, and remember, we're talking about the two things that we need to do, and we said number one is focus on God and what he's doing. If I focus on God and what he's doing, and I don't get caught up in all the conspiratorial thinking, and I don't live in dread like the rest of the world does, what would be the outcome of that? Verse 17, Isaiah said, I will wait for the Lord. Can I say that one more time? I will wait for the Lord. What he is saying is, I am thoroughly willing to be in the presumed losing minority for a little while because God is at work and I'm cool being in the minority. I'm behind enemy lines. I'm not going to get caught up in conspiratorial thinking. I'm not going to live in dread like everybody else. My king is at work and I belong to him. Number two, if I'm going to focus number one on God and what he's doing in the world, number two is the word of God must become more important to us than it ever has before. I don't have the verse in my scriptures tonight, but David in Psalm 119 said, Lord, I need a map. Anybody else feel like that? I mean, trying to navigate 2021, who, who else needs a map? You know, in Isaiah's time, look at this. Some may say to you, let's ask the mediums. That would be the experts of the day. Let's ask the experts and those who consult the spirits of the dead with their whisperings and mutterings. They will tell us what to do. And it's about the same thing as social media. But shouldn't people ask God for guidance? Should the living seek guidance from the dead? Look at this. Look to God's instructions and teachings. People who contradict his word are completely in the dark. They will go from one place to another, weary and hungry. And because they are hungry, they will, what's the next word, New Spring? They will rage. Have you ever seen such rage as there is in our world today? It's because people are not secure. And they don't know where to look. They look one direction. They can't find help. They look another direction. And the Bible says they're there because they won't trust God's word. They will look up to heaven and down to the earth. And wherever they look, there will be trouble and anguish and dark despair. They will be thrown out in darkness. So here's the thing. As we close out this message today, God has strongly warned us not to think like everybody else. Focus on what God's doing. And number two, trust God's word in your heart and life more than you ever have before. And that may not feel like warfare, but that's where the battle is won. Three thoughts and I'm through. Number one, thinking is way more important to God than we realize. Most Christians believe that you can't control what you think. You know, whatever happens to be in your head just happens to be in your head. You, Christians think you can control your actions, but you can't control your thinking. To God, it's very different. God believes we can control our thinking. Let me show you some scriptures very quickly from the word of God. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, look at the verb here, fix. That means fasten. Fasten your thoughts on what is true and good and right. Think about things that are pure and lovely and dwell on fine, good things. And, and others, think about all you can do to praise God and be glad about it. God is saying, fasten your thought on, thoughts on good things, positive, joyful things. Colossians 3, verse 2, set like you set your radio or your dial or your television, like you pull in a particular site on the internet. Set your minds on things above and not on earthly things. That's what we've been talking about. Here's a verse that's really helped me, and I know this is helpful for ladies too, but I think it's especially helpful for men in the area of lust. I've, I've, this verse has been important to me ever since I've been a young, very young man. In Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, the Bible says, guard your heart. Above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Heart there means your mind. Guard your thinking because everything in life comes out of your thinking. I mean, the idea of Proverbs 4, verse 23, is like in the old days, all, every family had a well that they would get the water that they would drink. And so they would guard their well. They wouldn't want anybody to put poison in their well because their children are going to drink out of it. And the Bible is saying, guard your mind that way. And I know this is beneficial for ladies, but it's really beneficial for guys. See, God, God, doesn't, God doesn't think that our thinking is happenstance. God holds us accountable for how we think. Number two, if that's the case, what is it right now that informs your thinking? And, and I don't want to go here for you. I'm going to go here for me, but you need to go here for you. The voices that are coming into your head right now, where are they coming from? You say, well, I watch this news channel, or I watch that news channel, or I read this information, or I'm on this blog. and Okay, that may be all right. But is it what's shaping your thinking? 
Because if it's not the word of God, if it's not God more than anyone else, you're putting yourself at risk. Who do you listen to? Who are your friends? Have you ever noticed that when you're around a negative, critical person, it's easy to pick it up? You, know, you, know, you don't have to raise your hand or anything, but how many of you work with somebody who's negative and critical? And you're like 12, 8, 10, 12 hours a day listening to them talk about this person and that person and what this person's doing and gossip. And you're not a negative person. You're a upbeat, positive person. But after 10 hours around that person, you start seeing all the problems in everybody else. I mean, you spend eight hours with some people, it's like you have to have a whole week of detox just to get back <laughs> thinking right again. On the other hand, have you ever been around somebody who's joyful and full of the love of God? And they can be going through all kinds of problems. I mean, it's like just when you see them coming, you feel like somebody just handed you a present. Yes. You know, a special lady here at New Springs has been a prayer warrior for me through the years, Maxine Berry. I mean, I know she's gone through some hard things in life, but she's got the joy of the Lord in her. I can be around Maxine for 30 seconds and I'm ready to charge hell with a squirt gun. <laughs> Man, if you've got negative people in your life, you, know, you may have to create some distance. You say, well, Mark, it's a problem because I'm married to him. I understand that's a challenge. <laughs> But you need to ask the question, who has the privilege to speak into your life? Some of us need to turn off some electronic sources in our life that are messing us up. Some of what they say may be true, but if it's making us despair, oh, we can't be a princess warrior if we do that. We can't be a prince warrior if we listen to that. Okay, one more thing. Sometimes we're more careful I got to tell you a story first. <laughs> About 15 years ago, I was speaking at a conference in Dallas. It was a conference with a lot of pastors. And, and so I, when I flew into DFW, I got there really, really late at night, and I had rented like a Ford Fusion or something like that, a little car. But it must have been something really big going on in Dallas because all the rent cars were gone. You know, it's like Jerry Seinfeld said, you know, at the rent car company, they can, they can take a reservation. They just can't hold it. <laughs> and so I got there, and the guy behind the rental counter said, we have only one vehicle. And he said, it's a work van. That means, you know, one of those white vans with no windows. <laughs> and I am the keynote speaker. My picture is on the front of the magazine for this conference, and I can see myself pulling up <laughs> in a work van. And I said to him, that won't work. Well, he said, you know how they look through the papers. I, I do have one other car. It's like a Cadillac with this, and it had a Corvette engine in it. Over 400 horsepower. He said, would that be okay? And I have to think that over. A work van? <laughs> and I said, I believe that'll work. So the conference, like two or three days, and so I'm you know, here, I'm in my hometown, and I'm like running around on I-35 and 635 going miles an hour. And <laughs> but it was the last night of the conference, and the pastor said to me, who was hosting the conference, he said, Mark, my, my, my team, my leadership team, would like to have you just come over and pour into our lives, just say whatever you want to say. We're going to have this meeting at one of my staff members' homes, and so would you just come over and just pour into our lives? And I said, well, that sounds fine. So I, the lead pastor was with me, and we pull up to the house, and the pastor said, I need to let you know there has been an enormous amount of auto vandalism and theft in this neighborhood. It's been on television. And he said, you know, the thieves will come in, in teams. They'll just, you know, jack the car up, put it on concrete blocks, strip it bare, and you come back out, and there's nothing but a frame. And I'm like, I'm, I'm responsible for that Cadillac. <laughs> I promise you, it did not take me long to pour into that team. I told them everything I knew in about 25 <laughs> minutes because I kept envisioning that car out there, you know, the Cadillac with the Corvette engine. <laughs> Finally, I said, guys, I'm just exhausted. I need to go. And I went out there, and to my joy, the Cadillac was still like I left it. And I got in the Cadillac, and I was driving away back to my hotel. And I was so thankful, and the Holy Spirit of God said to me, Mark, you're way more careful about where you park your car than where you park your mind.
the Lord has strongly warned me not to think like everyone else. He's warned me to focus on him and what he's doing and his word and to make God holy in my life. Thanks for being with me for the first week of Worlds of Warfare 2. We'll crank this in next week. God bless. See you soon.